It is so good to see all of you out again this evening to hear another lesson from God's great word. I am very appreciative of this opportunity that I have to come and, and present a lesson, and I, I thank you all for letting that happen. Tonight, we're going to be talking about something that goes along with, my, with the lesson my dad did a couple of Sundays ago of using emotion, or yeah, emotions in your worship. And a key part of using emotion is rejoicing. So this evening, we're going to be talking about rejoicing in the Lord. And to start off, would you please turn to Philippians 4, verse 4. Philippians is a fantastic book talking about all the joy and thanksgiving um, written by Paul. Philippians 4, 4 reads, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. If you would turn back one page in my Bible, but to the first chapter of Philippians, and look at Philippians 1, verses 15, starting, it says, Some indeed preach Christ from, ev from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am here, that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking uh, to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in, and in that I rejoice. One more example of re rejoicing in Philippians is um, in Fli the second chapter of Philippians, starting in verse 16. It reads, Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, something interesting to think about is at this time of Paul writing this letter, he's in prison in Rome, alone, uh, without his friends. And this book is just so joyous. And he's focusing on rejoicing in the Lord always, as, as stated earlier in Philippians 4. And sometimes I like to think if I was in jail in a far off country and I was writing a letter to my friends, how that would look. And, and if I'm being honest with myself, I, I feel like it would look very differently. I probably would be complaining about how uncomfy the bed is or how bad the food is or how I miss my friends and all that. But if you look through Philippians, it's full of rejoicing the whole way through. And that just goes to show that even in trouble, you can rejoice in the Lord. An Old Testament example of that that I like to look at is Abraham, leaving his, his home country of Ur and traveling to a distant country. And sometimes when I study that story, I just think, oh yeah, God told Abraham to leave and he left. And it's not a big deal. But that was a huge deal, especially in the fact that Ur at that time was the major superpower in the, in that, in, in the world at the time. And in Ur... Archaeologists have found that they had permanent housing, and we know that Abraham was a fairly wealthy man with all of these cattle and servants. So we can we can um, conclude that he probably had a house there, and God told him to leave and to go off to Canaan. And you'd be like, yeah, but he went off to Canaan, that was fine. But Canaan at this time it was full of factions of different people, and they used supremacy to stay in control, and it was a nasty place over there. So he, he had to travel around not being able to stay in one spot anymore. And I mean, think how tough that would have been for Abraham to have to pick up his whole family and take everybody and all of his servants and his family and, and Lot and travel off. Another example would be Daniel going into the lion's den, or Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego living in Babylon during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, just being surrounded by all this evil and idolatry, and even and for standing up for their beliefs, being thrown into the fiery furnace for that. Think about how tough um, that would have been to rejoice in, in the Lord. And sometimes I feel like we can fall into that same trap of well, if I ask the question, do you rejoice in the Lord? Everyone in here would be like, yes, I rejoice in the Lord. God is great, and, and I rejoice in that. But I feel like we can fall into the trap of only sometimes rejoicing in the Lord rather than all the time. I, for example, Sundays. Yeah, spiritual high. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. I'm here with all of my Christian friends in a great, in a great place, singing praises, rejoicing in the Lord. 
But as we go through the re week, Monday and Tuesday, not even, not really thinking about it. But then you come back Wednesday. Wednesday, rejoicing in the Lord yet again. And then through the rest of that week, again, not rejoicing through the rest of the week. I think a great example of that is back in the Old Testament in Exodus, Exodus 14, when the um, Israelites were being taken out of Egypt. And we, we all know the story of the plagues, right, and how the Israelites at the time, they were not a big fan because, because of the plagues. The Egyptians were making it harder on them. Um, so they were not rejoicing in the Lord at that time, obviously. But then think about the great joy that they would have felt when Pharaoh finally let them go and they were exiting the gates of, of Egypt. Think about that great joy. And then if you will look at um, chapter 14, starting in verse 10, it says, When Pharaoh drew near, near, the people of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out, to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, is it, is, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done bringing us out of Egypt? It is not what, um, what we said to you, is it not what we, we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So you can see that instant flip, that instant flip. Now if you look over one more chapter in to verse uh, or to chapter 15, looking at verse 1, after God delivers them across the Red Sea and destroys the great armies of Pharaoh, starting in verse 1 it says, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. So now, after in a great time, and when life is going good for them, after they've been delivered, the, the whole first part of 15 is the rejoicing in the Lord that, that, that God delivered them. But if you look down in that same chapter, skipping down to uh, verse 20, 23, when they come to Marah, and it says, When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of, of Marah because it was bitter, therefore it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. And the Lord made for them a statue, uh, a statue and a rule, and there he tested them. So you can see in the same verse, after this great act of power and God delivering the Israelites from the Egyptian army, not even a chapter later, they're again, they flip right back. They flip right back into not rejoicing in the Lord always. And we can be guilty of this, like I've said, going through the week Sunday, yes, rejoicing in the Lord. And when it's going good for you, yes, of course, rejoicing in the Lord. But in times of trouble and in times of trial, sometimes we can fall into the trap of not rejoicing as much in those times. So before I close and hand it off to Aiden, uh, let's take a look at a couple of reasons why we should be rejoicing in the Lord. And obviously, if I was to go over every reason why we we need to re be rejoicing in the Lord, I would be up here forever because there's infinite amounts of reasons why we should rejoice in our great God. But the first I want to look at is the great gift of prayer that he gives us. If you can turn back all the way to the end of your Bibles in Hebrew, starting in chapter 4, we get the description of God's throne room and, how, and, and the magnificence of it. So, um, Revelation 4, I'll be starting in verse 2, it reads... Oh, wait. Oh, Revelation 4, verse 2. My bad. I was in uh, chapter 2. But it says in verse 2, At once I was in spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder before the throne. Oh, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. 
The first living creature like a, like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four, four living creatures, each of us with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him, who is seated on the throne and, and who believes or, or who lives forever and ever. And the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him, he who li- him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. If you look over one more chapter into chapter 5, looking at verse 8, it reads, And when he had taken the scroll and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So here we see this magnificent um, description of God's throne room and how intimidating and how, how spectacular that would have been. Now if you could turn over to Hebrews for me. In, verse, in chapter 4, Hebrews 4, it talks about Jesus being the great high priest. So Hebrews 4, uh, starting in verse 14, it reads, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted and, yet, and as we are, yet without sin. Let us... Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in our time of need. The gift of prayer and, and God wanting to have this, this relationship with us is so important. I'm in the class, the high school class right now is a friend of the father and it has been a spectacular class um, on reasons like that we need to have a close relationship with God. It has been absolutely spectacular, and we did a couple lessons on prayer that just blew me away. And the comparison here is talking about in, in Revelation, seeing the magnificent throne room and, and all the living creatures and the elders, but then in Hebrews we see that he wants us there, to, telling us to draw near with confidence, and how thankful we, we should be for that. And we should rejoice that someone so powerful some, and God being so powerful wants to have this relationship with us. And secondly, secondly, we should be rejoicing in God because the gift that he gives us of having the opportunity of living eternal life in heaven with him. So if you would turn over to John 3, 16, I'll be reading a passage there. John 3, 16 is a, probably one of the most quoted verses in scripture, and it should be. John 3, starting in verse 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. If this it right here isn't reason enough to be rejoicing in God all the time, as it's stated in Philippians 4.4, 4, I, I don't know what it is. Having this opportunity of being with him in paradise for eternity is the greatest gift that someone could be given. And he's given us this opportunity by sacrificing his son. So we should be rejoicing, one, that he, he loved us enough to do that. And so now that we have that, so we have that opportunity. So before I hand it off to Aiden, I would like to leave you with one thought. And it's, it's this. Do you want to be like Paul, who even in tr- times of trouble was rejoicing in the Lord always? Or do you want to be like the Israelites, who are just rejoicing in the Lord sometimes and when it's going their way? Aiden? Hey, Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight, and I also want to thank the elders for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be speaking in front of you. This has been an outstanding thing to be a part of. I think Malachi can agree on that, and I would love to be a part of something like this again in the future as well. 
A study showed that the most common phobias to man are public speaking, heights, spiders, and of dying. Tonight, I want to focus on the last one, being the fear of dying. Some of you older folks may know a man by the name of Ken Green. He's a gospel preacher that has been preaching for around 60 years, and he's converted hundreds to Christ, including my granddad, who then became a preacher after that. And recently, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and he wrote a letter to my granddad reading this. Yesterday, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I'm beginning chemo treatments next Thursday. I understand the survival rate isn't very high, but I have a peace that passes all understanding about all that. I have reasons for not being anxious to leave this world real soon, but will joyfully leave those matters to the Lord. Sadly, many Christians today do not have the attitude that Kendra has when facing our Lord when we die. We all have a natural fear of death because of the unknown, and we have had nobody come back to us and tell us what it's like, but I want to talk about the unnatural fear of death and why Christians should not have that. So tonight, that's what we're going to be talking about, is how to overcome the fear of death. The first thing I have for you is that we need to realize that God has a plan for us. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Acts 13, 36. Again, that's Acts 13, 36. And it reads, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. Now, I want to focus on the beginning part where it says, After he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep. The felling asleep part is referring to dying. And I find this so interesting because it's saying that David didn't die until he had completed God's plan. So like David, after we have fulfilled God's plan for us, that is when we will die. Now turn with me to Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a good future and a hope. This verse clearly states again that God does have a plan for us. And just like the verse in Acts, it's saying that we won't die until God's plan is complete. For some, God's plan very well could be accomplished with your death, when that's bringing somebody to Christ in your death. And then another way that we can conquer our fear of death is focusing on bringing others to Christ. I'd like you to turn me to Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. And this reads, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood... He himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all lifetime subject to bondage. Now, the author of Hebrews makes it very clear here that if you look to Christ, you will no longer fear death. And I believe once we do that, that is when we should start encouraging others to do the same thing. And then let's look at Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. And Jesus says here, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Right here, Jesus is telling us what our purpose on earth earth is to do. We need to develop a sort of attitude of, how many people can I bring to Christ today? Or, what are some opportunities I can take in my daily life to help others bring to Christ? And once we are focused on that, we won't have a need to worry for death anymore. And then finally, I want to talk about viewing death as a blessing. Now, I want to start this off by mentioning the Viking culture for a second. If you don't know, for Vikings, their heaven is this place called Valhalla. And the only way to get to this Valhalla is to die in combat. Now, this was why Vikings were so terrifying to face in combat, is because they would be taking opportunities and attacking in ways that normal men wouldn't. And... This sort of attitude has always just fascinated me about these people because they have this attitude of, so what if I die? I'll be in a better place towards false gods while Christians, we sometimes have the attitude as death is a bad thing when we have proof of a creator that's created this entire universe. Uh, Now I want you to turn with me to Philippians 1 and verse 21. Some of you probably know this verse, but it is, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
We all need to have this attitude. Once we focus on our spiritual and eternal lives rather than our physical lives, our physical lives will become pointless, and we won't need to worry about them anymore. In the Acts class, we talked about when Peter was in prison in Acts 12, how he was sound asleep before Herod was going to bring him to trial the next day, where he was most likely going to kill him after that trial was over, just like he did with Jesus. And not long before then, Peter had denied Christ three times because he was afraid for his physical life. And we can see over a small period of time that Peter has grown as a Christian substantially because he's able to literally sleep soundly before the night of his death. Now I want you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes 7, 1 through 2. A good name is better than a precious ointment, and the day of death is better than the day of one's birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. This is a reminder of what is important to us. As humans, we kind of have that attitude of we ourselves are mortal, but everybody around us is mortal. But that's not the case. Death is a fate that everyone is going to have. And when we meet God, if we're saved, it's going to be a blessing when he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, if you do have anxiety about your daily life and are not right with God, then you should fear death. I remember when I wasn't a Christian and I would be lying awake at night wondering where my eternity was supposed to be spent and if I was going to go to heaven. And once I became a Christian, I didn't have that attitude anymore and started making my life right with God. A Christian has the peace that passes all understanding, but the good news is it's available to anybody who seeks it. And this reminds me of a story you guys may have heard before. A dying man asked his Christian doctor to tell him something about the place that he was going. As the doctor fumbled for a reply, he heard scratching at the door, and he had an answer. Do you hear that? He asked his patient. It's my dog. I left him downstairs. But he has grown impatient and has come up and hears my voice. He has no notion of what's inside this door, but he knows that I am here. Isn't this the same with you? You don't know what lies beyond the door, but you have your master, and he is there. If you are not subject with the invitation tonight, please come forward while we stand and sing.